welcome so much, uh, Shraddha, uh, and for accepting, uh, you know, this this invite from us to share about your latest research. Um, so before we begin, I just want to give a formal introduction of Shraddha. Uh, I have known Shraddha for over a year now, uh, uh, and she's from Pune, and this is where even uh, uh, we currently operate from. So BMT Support Foundation operates from Pune. Uh, yeah, so Shraddha has recently published a paper on the need for psychosocial research and its impact on patients and caregivers. Uh, she is currently a doctoral research scholar at IIT Hyderabad. She focuses on psycho-oncology with a special interest in pediatric cancer, uh, supportive care for parents and caregivers, and her research publications include areas such as cancer survivorship, psychosocial research in pediatric and endocrine health, which has been published in several national and international journals. She has previously been a psychology lecturer and a faculty member at various universities in Pune. So, so over to you, Shraddha, and really thank you so much for accepting this, uh, you know, on behalf of all of us. So over thank to you. you. Thank you so much, Neerat, for the wonderful introduction and for the invite, of course. Um, I want to begin by thanking the audience as well for joining um, in such large numbers because I understand that at 5 p.m. on a work day, you're ending your work and then joining in. So I'm really, really grateful to everybody who has joined in for this. Um, I'd like to also start uh, sharing my presentation. So please let me know once that is visible and I will um, really quickly start on that first. I hope this is visible, Neerat. Yes, I can see it. All right. So um, thank you very much, everybody. I'd like to start with a little bit of an introduction on what kind of research we're looking at, um, particularly the research that I have engaged in for the past uh, three year, three about three years. Um, while I have been a doctoral research scholar at IIT Hyderabad uh, with the supervision of Dr. Mahati Chittam, who is uh, my guiding professor. And uh, I'd like to begin by saying that the interest in pediatric psycho-oncology um, is something that I focus in in particular uh, because I believe that while we always have the patients and the caregivers involved in all types of cancer care, um, pediatrics in particular is a really important sector where we have to focus on the parents and the family caregivers. And this is also not because the patient is, you know, usually not of an age where they might, A, they might not completely understand what's going on with them, or B, they might not be um, able to sort of contribute to the decisions that are made for their care. And so research in pediatrics needs to look at or demands that we look at both the patient well-being, the caregiver well-being, and now, uh, very, very importantly, also the physicians and medical staff and counselors and everybody else, all of the support networks that are involved in treating uh, patients of pediatric cancers. So first of all, I'd like to say that September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, so we're, we're having this talk uh, and the ones obviously before this uh, with Alejandra as well uh, at a very opportune time. <laughs> um, but I'd like to say that India is among the worst hit um, countries when it comes to childhood cancers. We have about 50,000 new cases of childhood cancers um, every year. We also see that with lower and middle income countries, the uh, mortality rate goes up with childhood cancers and of course the way that patients and caregivers access healthcare facilities is going to change. Um, India being so vast and geographically diverse also uh, you know depends on a lot of urban centers to provide care. So a lot of the tertiary almost all of the tertiary care centers in fact um, are placed at least in semi-urban or urban areas. And um, we know that survival rate depends a lot on the child receiving a timely diagnosis, um, the right kind of decision making about the treatment plans, and of course, adhering to the treatment, coming up for follow-ups, um, the parents being able to take up the financial and the emotional uh, burden and coping with all of it. So all of these factors are heavily, heavily um, involved in the way that children with cancer um, are treated. Now, while this is um, very, very understood, we do need to ask 
that um, what is psychosocial care? Sorry, psychosocial research. First of all, psychosocial care, of course. But uh, why do we focus on it so much in research? And why is it needed in cancer, particularly in pediatric oncology? So I always like to ask four questions. And again, like I said, this is uh, very common in other illnesses as well, but particularly because this is my interest area. Um, is it only the, only the illness that impacts the patient? Is it only the patient that is affected by the illness? Are only the physicians and medical staff responsible for the patient's care? And is only one aspect, such as the physical aspect of the patient affected and should then be focused on? So I think it's very, very important um, to understand that these questions give us the answer that yes, we do need to talk about psychosocial care and that implies we talk about psychosocial research, which basically brings us to the next part, which is what is psychosocial research and why do we look at it? So there are three reasons why psychosocial research is a necessity in health and medical sectors in general. The first is social context. India being an extremely um, culturally diverse, socially diverse country, there's language, there is economic disparities, there's other forms of marginalization. Um, there are different family systems. There are ways in which um, various stakeholders participate in the Indian healthcare system. And so the social context, the stigma, the conversations around cancer are all very important to be understood. The second is subjectivity. So um, I know that a lot of us look at research in a very numerical aspect. Um, for a lot of psychologists and even myself, for instance, when I was trained as a psychologist first, uh, we were shown research to be very statistics heavy, very number heavy. But we need to understand that when it comes to lived experiences, especially in healthcare or in disease, um, the subjectivity of that experience matters a lot. So the systemic aspects matter, of course, but the subjectivity matters a lot as well. And we often see that there are aspects like gender differences. So even when we looked at parents of children with cancer, we found that uh, the needs of mothers and fathers differ, or we saw that family, other family caregivers being involved was a very subjective experience. For some parents, it was um, a huge support. For some parents, it was unnecessary, and uh, so on and so forth. So that's really important. And I believe that the two of these then lead to the emotional aspect of any disease. When we are working with childhood cancer, we realize that the emotional upheaval that an event like having your own child diagnosed with cancer can cause, we realize that the emotional support needed also has to be stepped up. And so research has to be um, sort of a deep dive into the emotional aspects of uh, pediatric cancer. So I'm going to describe and discuss a little bit about our own studies that I've um, been able to be a part of through this PhD journey. Um, the reason I'm uh, uh, talking about this research a little bit is because I believe they demonstrate good examples or examples of psychosocial research. Um, and I think it talks about the various areas that are highlighted and again the need for psychosocial research um, is sort of spotlighted through all of these. So the first study that we were able to conduct was a, um, an examination of the unmet supportive care needs of family caregivers. What we did was, um, there is a questionnaire called the Cancer Needs Questionnaire, Parents and Carers uh, booklet, which means we assess the needs of parents and caregivers of children who have cancer. And we did this in the at the treating hospitals. And then we um, saw which parts the parents and caregivers rated as very high needs or where their needs were not being met. So what was very significant here was that out of uh, the top 10 reported unmet needs, five of them were emotional needs. So the parents, the caregivers and parents reported feeling stressed, depressed, anxious, distressed at seeing the child in pain. Um, and then there were also social aspects. So parents uh, and caregivers who had lower education levels, um, had more unmet needs in certain areas. Then the families who lived further away from the treating hospitals were also more likely to report the needs. 
Now, this is where the geographical aspect of the uh, the research comes in because a lot of parents um, were traveling with their sick child for miles and miles, sometimes even hundreds and thousands of miles. So we saw that parents from the northern part of India were coming all the way down to the south or northeastern parts of India, western parts of India. And so um, when you have to travel so many miles simply to get treatment, um, and to get that treatment every month, every three weeks, especially when there's a chemotherapy cycle. Um, it's very difficult for these parents to then cope with it without considering the travel, uh, the distance aspect as a part. So this is where the social aspect comes in as well. I'm going to talk also a little bit about the retinoblastoma research that we've undertaken. And the reason I've talked about this is because, uh, like we were discussing previously, Neera, retinoblastoma, even though uh, called a rare cancer, it has at least 1,500 new cases in India. And so um, the maximum um, group of, sorry, the maximum patients fall within the age group of zero to four years. So mean age of presentation is about 25 months, 15 to 25 months, which is a very, very young age. Um, so patients are very young, um, most of the times they can't really make sense of what's going on and a lot of times the parents of these patients are also equally baffled because retinoblastoma's awareness is very very low, uh, particularly with the parents we interviewed, almost none of them knew about retinoblastoma's existence before their own child was diagnosed. And then we also then explored what kind of questions they had in their mind. So we again uh, went from a survey research, a questionnaire research to a more qualitative interview-based research where we talked about unmet needs in supportive care. So we interviewed parents. We looked at the differences in themes between mothers and fathers. And we also looked at differences where the child had had an enucleation, which is the removal of the eye to stop the spread of cancer and chemotherapy. So we wanted to see whether there's any common issues, any separate issues, all of those. So particularly we saw that there are so many information needs. The parents need a lot of information about um, the decision making, the treatment related plans, about awareness about the disease itself. They also want to know what is causing this disease. So in a lot of childhood cancers, this was reported across that the parents were very confused. Did we do this? Is it something that happened in pregnancy? A lot of times the stigma affects the mother a lot. So even uh, the practitioners who are working there told us that so many times we've seen the family members all point towards the mother saying that she must have done something wrong, which is not the case a lot of times in a lot of childhood cancers. Um, they're inherited or there's other factors involved. So um, their stigma uh, removal and awareness of the disease were very important facts that they stated they were unmet needs. And then of course, supportive care. So dealing with the logistics of traveling all the way, the financial burden of it, the caregiver burden that comes on parents when parents have to set everything else aside, um, having to look after the siblings of these children. So this is what constitutes, all of this constitutes the social aspect of, um, of the research that we are looking at. And of obviously the emotional distress and the difficulties dealing and coping with it the psychological aspect as well. So we looked at some interview prompts and we talked about um, information needs. We also asked them if support groups were helpful, if peer support was helpful. And so the main common aspect that almost everybody told us was that we'd, we would have loved to know more. We would have really liked to know more. So I want to know more about the disease. I want to know more about my child's health. Um, the kind of diet I need to feed them after chemotherapy, how do I take care of their prosthetic, how do I take care of them once they are, you know, going to go to school, is that going to be normal for them? So parents had a lot of questions that needed to be addressed. Then, of course, this led to a stigma uh, concern. So there was concern towards the patients. Um, there are family members who had a lot of stigma about the children. And of course, supportive care. So all of these aspects, understanding prosthetics, going to school, financial aid. And uh, the last and the most important aspect that we realized was that there's so much emotional distress uh, with parents particularly, not just because there is organ loss where 
the eye is being removed or even in um, our previous study right which was with children of children having all different types of cancers um the the emotional distress was not just over the child's pain and having to see the child in pain but also a lot of concern over whether they were making the right decisions whether um, there would be any side effects to the treatment how would it be in the future for them and so breaking the bad news sort of gave rise to all of these questions and for parents particularly and this is where i think pediatrics is so um, so much of my focus is also because parents say we can't worry about this we have no time to worry about this because the child is the priority how can we complain when it is the child who has cancer and which is why when the paper um, was something that i you know decided to take up and focus i wanted to see whether there was caregiver research as well that was going on so um, of course in our research uh, the parents said that peer support helped communicating with the healthcare providers helped understanding how to talk to their child about what was happening was very helpful being able to ask questions was helpful and of course uh, being able to address the emotional distress and burden without guilt was very nice so a lot of parents said that they really wanted to talk to somebody it was really nice to be able to talk about it to express um, for the first time maybe in months after the treatment had started that they were actually in distress in the first place because they had not said this to anybody at home of course they had to be strong in front of their child and all of these are uh, these were things expressed by the parents themselves that um where parents said that you know we can't afford to be weak in this time um so emotional distress was often really kind of kept on the back burner um and this was a major concern so circling back to the review article really quickly um the review article was a review a narrative review essentially of research that is being conducted in psychosocial um or psychosocial aspects being researched in pediatric cancer in india and uh, mostly a lot of the studies look at survivorship outcomes and quality of life they look at parent and caregiver needs they look at patient parent and caregiver communication they look at psychosocial interventions um and they look at patient needs and psychosocial concerns now i'm what i'm going to do also is i'm really quickly going to um share a link with all of you on the chat uh while we are on this slide so this is a link to the article it's an open access article um it's been published by the indian journal of pediatric and medical oncology um and you're all welcome to please uh, access the link and download it it's like i said it's open access so please go ahead um i'd love any feedback once you read it as well but the paper also found that all of our research the way we are researching um psychosocial aspects has several limitations So firstly of course like i said it's scattered and urban uh, scattered and limited to the urban centers it is heavily clinic based so a lot of the research even in support survivorship is happening in clinics um there is a lot of case studies and trial interventions so although this is good uh, to to begin with it needs to become a lot more robust in terms of the methodology used or it needs to be replicated across settings for it to be a viable um sort of source of model development then uh, the most common aspect is cross sectional surveys and um, although i love surveys they are a fantastic tool to gather data i also believe very strongly that we need detailed research in order to understand patient and parent and even physician and uh, staff experience the experiences of social workers everybody who is involved there i don't think that it's uh, uh, it's sufficient in any way to only collect survey data so definitely this is a other issue um we don't really the research didn't really talk about treatment adherence and abandonment um it didn't really talk about organ loss caregiver burden information needs and grief and bereavement is also very rarely addressed so nobody was talking about end of life care for children or uh, what happens when uh, when a family loses the child um how how do they deal with that distress and all of that so all of these topics are still very um not very much not there in the indian research scenario right now so lastly um this is my these are my thoughts on how we move forward based on the research i've seen um one we i believe we need researchers who are trained to conduct psychosocial research 
Um, and I say this very, very strongly because um, I believe that uh, the, ro the more robust our research is, the more strong it is on methodology, we'll be able to develop empirical models. Then we, of course, need to have networks of stakeholders who can contribute to and implement to this research. So we cannot do this alone. Um, neither psychologists, nor medical practitioners, nor only social workers can do this by themselves. We need everybody involved. We need the patients, the parents, caregivers, everybody uh, to be equal participants, willing participants. Um, and of course, we need robust, culturally sensitive models that are grounded in evidence. So India, particularly, again, I keep repeating myself, maybe, but again, we cannot ignore social norms, gender roles, um, the way that uh, people are treated or ill people are sort of navigated around in India. It's very different, um, you know. Um, then, of course, exploring communication in the patient, caregiver, and physician triad. So how does the patient talk to the parent or the caregiver? How does the doctor talk to the patient or the caregiver? How do parents and caregivers make decisions based on what information the doctors give them? All of this is super important. I mean, you need to talk about it. Um, talking about peer support, I think you are the best person to say that peer support, you know, does wonders. It is literally one of the most important magical things that can happen to patients. Um, so yes, we, we need more research on peer support. And of course, understanding lived experience through a very critical social lens. Uh, we need to talk about access issues or issues that are, uh, you know, that prevent people from seeking care, whether they may be financial, social, or any other. So all of this is super important. And I believe uh, from the research we've done so far, from the research we hope to do in future, the importance of psychosocial research is really strongly highlighted. Um, I would like to see it in, of course, in pediatrics, that being my field of uh, comfort and favor, but also in um, other fields like other chronic illnesses, cancer, uh, cancers when it comes to adult patients and everybody else as well. I'd just like to very quickly give a shout out to my research group, the Health Associated Cooperative and Supportive Group. Um, and uh, you can see that we do research in a number of interesting topics. Our supervisor, Dr. Mahati, uh, somebody I would like to give a big shout out to as well for guiding me. And thank you very much, everybody. Um, so gold is, a gold ribbon uh, is what uh, we wear for childhood cancer awareness. And uh, I hope that everybody um, invests in that, everybody who's involved in this. We hope for more stakeholders being actively involved in both research and intervention. Thank you so much. Wow, so thank you so much Radha. And uh, if you can stop, yeah, brilliant. Uh, I think this was a you know a really wonderful presentation. It has opened a lot of uh, scope for several conversations I think that can continue over this month on on you know on on just various topics that you highlighted and i'm so glad that you actually brought out certain very very pertinent points that relate to the need for these kind of not only research but also interventions as we go along in the way because uh, you know we need to translate them into actual interventions and create models either it can be you know uh, interventions at the hospital level, at the peer support group level, at the NGO level, at the communication level, be it in terms of videos, in terms of handbooks, uh, whatever that is out there in various languages, I think we need to bring that out in terms of translating that research into actionable items. So this this really is a good food for thought and, and I think it just puts us into the mode of what all can we do this year to, to at least contribute in a, you know, in, in in a more concrete way about what we have been doing. Um, so I'm just going to come with certain questions that I have for you. Uh, and then, you know, we will open it up for, for the audience. Yeah. I think one of the things that clearly uh, was probably not your scope, uh, you know, of this is, uh, is the role of of several patient support groups uh, in this process. And it could be NGOs like, you know, like, like we saw there are people from Cardinals Foundation, 
uh, and then the entire psychosocial group that you work with from IIT Hyderabad, we at BMT Support Foundation, uh, you know, kind of work. Then there is an entire uh, foundation that works purely on psycho-oncology in Pune and stuff like that. So where do you see this or, or did you during your research, let me ask you this from a practical perspective, did you during your research come across come across people coming forth and sharing with you the importance of having these groups? So, Absolutely, you, yes. yes. Yeah? So I always want to say that humans will inherently look for support. Uh, that's just how it is. So even when uh, there are no formal support groups in hospitals, parents who are looking at other parents for tips on how to manage their children's uh, care, whether it's chemo, whether it's diet, and they will instinctively reach out to people who, you know, they share a language with um, or they share a hometown with. Usually the conversations began with, are you from so-and-so city? Um, and this exactly highlights the importance of support groups. So yes, uh, we were seeing them everywhere. I think almost all of us who um, have worked in these sectors see that there are diabetes support groups. There are um, cancer support groups for both adults. Um, the reason why I believe that we need more uh, more work in support groups as well is because I think um, as a researcher, we need more models to inform support groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think support groups are doing some wonderful work out there. Right. Um, they have beautifully structured sessions. They're, they're providing support and care. But we as researchers and maybe even counselors um, have to step up and bring in the uh, the research that we're doing because then we'll be able to highlight these differences even when peer support is being given right the the gender aspect or the um even the the disease differences for example the condition differences okay. um i think i think that's where it is important mm -hmm. great and i think you spoke about quality of life and this is one where uh, it's a very itchy uh, Yes. <laughs> you know, in the conversation. I'm really sorry to bring this word up because, uh, yeah. you know, like recently I was having a conversation with the European Bone Marrow Transplant Support Group. So they have a patient advocacy committee specifically focused on 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 this, you know, on on the stem cell transplant, and they they have now been able to become a part of the research uh, QOL, you know, in terms of coming up with questionnaires or making changes. And they said that, let us do this, you know, some of this research. Exactly. And what they found out was very interesting in terms of when this research happened at the hospital level or in a clinical setup, the findings were different versus independently when they sat with people who were more like peer to peer kind of conversations, you know, the findings were different. So how do you see we can bridge this gap in the Indian scenario? Who has to work harder? Do we have to work harder <laughs> as NGOs to knock the doors of hospitals and say, bring us in? Or uh, is there a way to create this awareness where they realize the need and start including us as a part of the process? So where do you see, how do we bridge this gap as we go along? Um, I think you made a beautiful point, Neera, that the narratives change when, um, when, when the person that asks the question changes. Right. So even when I was collecting data in the hospital, um, several parents were very concerned about whether if they uh, expressed any dissatisfaction with their care, whether it was going to go back to the doctors, whether I was going to report to the hospital and um, if that would you know affect their services in any way or the, the care their child was given in any way. Um, so I think when we're talking about quality of life or supportive care, we have to have um, triangulation we have to have multiple researchers in multiple settings um people who people who are able to provide the support can yeah. also then report on it so like you mentioned right um as a support as somebody who runs a support group who has founded a support group um and when i was i was so um interested in your uh, the whole journey that you talked about with, with bmt patients and why is it why it's fascinating is that when people actually are there with the patient, with the caregivers, while they go through that journey, they'll be able to see all of those emotional ups and downs, all of the ways in which the patient is coping. Right. And so I think we need to, again, like I said, we need to do a multi-expert, multi-stakeholder kind of research. Mm -hmm. 
and i think this is less about uh, who is who needs to work harder yeah. but yeah. who ne- who can collaborate with whom <laughs> mm. um, and who you can hold hands with essentially to to make sure that there is research both in the clinic and outside the clinic uh, when the patient is in treatment and when they are outside of treatment beautiful beautiful no I, absolutely and i think uh, all of us you know need to join hands to work uh, so I have one last question before we kind of, you know, move on. Uh, you spoke about lived experience and, uh, you know, that's that's a topic of my personal interest uh, in, in just many ways, you know. And I think one of the things that I really wanted to understand is, is that there are always going to be differences in lived experience, right? Lived experience of a patient, lived experience of a caregiver, lived experience of a doctor, lived experience of a nurse lived experience of a researcher yeah right how difficult was you to eliminate these biases in the process so that you are able to absolutely come to genuine data and understand this from a deep uh, from a sense where the biases are removed from every aspect or or some aspect of bias inevitably remains in the process how does this work in a research scenario um, so first of all, I think we cannot ignore biases. We have to um, assume and acknowledge that there is always going to be a bias, even from us as researchers. Um, so we have to understand that hu- any any human related research, any individual related research is always going to be um, uh, fueled or it's going to be informed by your own positionality. And so positionality is very, very important as a researcher. But uh, I'd like to echo my my supervisor's words here, uh, who says that what we need is a body of research. And by that, I mean that um, we need need study upon study that layers and um, fills in the gaps that have been left by the previous studies. So if a particular study has looked at patient experiences, we now need studies that look at caregiver experiences. Then we need studies that look at physician experiences. Then we need studies that uh, that observe the interactions of these three groups together. Mm. Mm. And this is a long process. So a robust research model is a very time consuming, um, very detailed process. It needs a lot of skill. But what this type of research can do is it can help us to triangulate the issues um, and then also help us realize whether the issue is individual or is it systemic. For instance, financial burden is not always necessarily an individual issue. It can be very systemic. It can be very, very much based on the marginalization of a particular community. Mm-hmm. Um, travel uh, can be based on the geographical location. Patient mm-hmm. care can be based on how much pressure a doctor is already facing. So we make a lot of demands from physicians and healthcare providers, but India unfortunately has an insane amount of uh, patient footfall. Um, even in pediatric cancer wards, um, we see that so many patients are there every single day. So we have to be very um, careful, we have to be very empathic, and we have to understand the provider's experience as well. So yeah, the layering of research is what we really need. And for that, like I mentioned in my penultimate slide, we need researchers trained in this. Um, and we need researchers who say that I can't do this alone. <laughs> we need the... Yeah, we need the inverse of the ultra confident researchers. We need researchers who say that you know I need help. I need people who can do this with me. Mm. No, that's so important, and thank you so much for uh, you know bringing this and and kind of you know sharing your perspective from uh, from heart. Uh, so just before we move on to the question, uh, you know, to the to just opening up for the audiences. Uh, uh, I'd like to take one minute to share about what we do at BMT Support Foundation uh, and the newly launched, uh, you know, portal. So it's called Swasti Astu, which means may you be well. And we all know, you know, how difficult a uh, time is. And the only thing is you can pray uh, is for somebody to be well. So this is a portal where we are really connecting the dots, as she said, in terms of survivorship in terms of patient, caregiver, communication. We have the best experts coming onto the forum and talking like, like we have today. You know, we have Shraddha here. Uh, caregiver's needs, there are discussion portals, there are forums that we can kind of create. And we really want to co-create this. You know, we, we don't own this portal. I think this is going to be a joint uh, 
joint collaboration with several people and we really want to work with the best of, of the best in this space so yeah so with that i invite everybody to uh, join this portal and i will share the link while the questions are being asked and stuff like that so please be a part of contribute in whatever way join the discussions open discussions and please come here and also share your experiences in terms of presentations for example you know we have a lot of people from the cuddles foundation and here is a question that was asked uh, by by somebody who is an expert in the pediatric space and i didn't have an answer for this and they asked us Nirat, during this neutropenia phase post bone marrow transplant where the cells are dropped uh, what kind of a diet recommendation would you give to people who live in South India, who live in West India, who live in North India, who live in East India. And obviously we were lost because we are not the experts in terms of, you know, providing nutritional options during neutropenia. But if there is a team in Cuddles that can really help us build this, uh, you know, for several patients who, who don't get benefited directly through the Cuddles, I think there is a lot of good that we can do to the world in, uh, you know, in terms of providing the right information. Yeah. So with this, I'm opening up for the audience for any questions. So please, uh, you know, just unmute yourself and and just start uh, start your Viva test for Shraddha now. So please go ahead. The it is open to the audience for this. I've been forewarned by Nirad that I'm going to be grilled. So <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> Um, oh, ma'am, I think your microphone is unfortunately still not functioning really well. No, unfortunately, ma'am, we still can't hear you. Um, but if you could type, I'd love to know any feedback. Thank you. I'd love to connect as well. Um, I'd be dropping my email ID here uh, in the chat box. And uh, I'd, I'd absolutely love uh, for anybody to write to me and uh, to chat, of course. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Shraddha, I have a question. Uh, I'm Amrita, also from Cuddles Foundation. Um, uh, you know, my question is that uh, given that India is so diverse, and as you said, people travel long distances to get the care that they need, uh, you know, the challenges that we face in even providing um, psychosocial care or support would be very distinct from anywhere else in the world. So, could you just talk about that a little? Absolutely. Um, so one of my favorite things to see when I used to go for field work and I start anecdotally because um, I used to always go to a very packed hospital and 90% um, of the times because you're only allowed two attenders, if it's a child, you're only allowed the parents, um, the entire lobby or the entire outside of the hospital would be filled with uh, grandparents, uncles, aunts, siblings, everybody. So my first and foremost um, sort of focus that I've always thought about is that we really need to understand that India has a lot of other family caregivers apart from parents when it comes to children. Um, and we also need to understand their requirements. We need to understand how their experiences have been. That's one really important thing. Um, the second aspect is that we do need more awareness. And um, the reason I say this is because um, I know that certain kinds of care can only be provided at tertiary or quaternary care centers, but a lot of times the child or the patient will only come there after um, a lot of going to different places uh, because there's sometimes a lack of awareness. A lot of parents still have difficulty believing that a child can have cancer. 
um so this is this is the uh, less ambitious idea because a more ambitious idea obviously would be being able to provide um, equal quality of care in the most remote locations but again that's an infrastructure concern uh, but definitely giving uh, tools and like neerat said handbooks ways in which parents can uh, do things remotely um the other aspect that we need to explore i think in india is telemedicine because travel is something that you addressed um so either telemedicine that is delivered live or which is delivered through videos um or booklets or various other um sort of you know now there are also applications so we need to look into that because parents again uh, when they are traveling they're not just uh, traveling with a ch with a sick child they're also losing uh, labor so a lot of the daily wage laborers who were parents of children said that you know the the days they come to the hospital is the day that they are not getting paid so we also need to understand that all of this is very interconnected the other thing i found is we have a lot of excellent financial aid schemes through a lot of ngos um a lot of hospitals are connected with csr foundations and they have a lot of wonderful schemes going on but a lot of parents aren't aware of these because there is no centralized repository of all of these so financial burden is the first and foremost aspect in india that parents uh, face so if parents have more of an understanding of where they can seek help where they are eligible to seek financial assistance and how they can navigate that process in the easiest possible way i think that would also be really important and last but not the least i want to say diet because time and again we've seen that in india there is so much diversity in diet right um, north south east west is uh, still a larger thing i would say that diet changes in india every 10 kilometers even right so somebody who is eating something in pune is not going to be eating the same thing in mumbai um, our staples are different our um, you know the ways in which we eat um are different and so it's very important to talk about diet in a very comprehensive manner and to make it very uh, specific for region for economic condition and for the ways that the family structure is thank you shraddha that was uh, that was really good it covered a lot of points and regarding diet uh, you know we have nikita also on the uh, call who is the head nutritionist at cuddles and she's been there for a while so she really emphasizes on this that we need to uh, diet, plan a diet which the uh, like you know it is uh, uh, native to the child whom we are seeing and so yeah that is something we try to tailor in the yeah. diet plans yes wow hi shraddha mm. uh, this hi, is sorry. mariam here from cuddles foundation so uh, wonderful presentation very insightful uh, so since um, i think you mentioned that survey is not a very good uh, method of data um can you Don't still hear sorry yeah mariam can you hear me in and out Uh, yeah sorry um, just not for a moment there sorry acha so i was saying that you mentioned that survey method is not a very good technique to collect the data so uh, because we you know this is more subjective data so how do you like what are the different methods that we can use to collect the data then right so i'm going to go ahead and say that i didn't say survey aren't isn't a good method it is a great method yeah. only surveys is not a good method okay um, okay yeah and the re see there's a very uh, good reason why surveys are taken because they are easier to disseminate um they are is easy easier to collect and they're easier to sometimes analyze also um but i do believe that we need surveys because again in india numbers is a very important thing we have huge patient footfalls um i think one of the most e the, one of the most important ways is to do mixed methods research um and mixed method research means that we again like i said triangulate we build layers of research using both quantitative and qualitative data so we take up um we take up surveys we take up numerical data where there are studies available where there is uh, where it's easier where they, where we can do nested work like you know where the if the patient or the parent can't read the survey questionnaire um there is someone available like a research assistant or a researcher who is going to ask them the questions um this is a this is a problem with a lot of surveys right a very real again a very real india problem that language is a barrier 
not a lot yes. of people may be literate or they might not be able to read the language of uh, questionnaires so somebody mm -hmm. should be available to ask them those questions and then on top of that if we layer um, qualitative research research which has interviews focus group discussions um, we can essentially take the best of both and amalgamate it into a good study so mixed methods research is a really good way to go um, but yeah some places we definitely do need to go purely qualitative because we don't have the scales yet. So scale development, uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going into like psychology 101, but scale development requires uh, empirical evidence. It requires models. True, true, yeah. yeah. It's like a bottom-up, build-up approach and we have miles yeah. to go. Correct. So actually, that was the whole, I mean, idea because we also deal with patients and caregivers who would not be able to read and write. So, you know, to cover a larger population only relying on interviewing will become a very difficult option okay Absolutely. thank you so much so i have a question before we move on Shraddha, to the next next question is that one of the complaints patient have had at least during you know while sharing with us uh, on on the platform and even otherwise is that they never get the complete picture of the possibilities of the treatment and the problems for example in bone marrow transplant when you have an allogenic stem cell transplant the chances that you could have a GBH is as high as about 60 to 70 percent. And uh, and it can really frustrate a person or a patient going through this process because he wants to come back to work quickly, go back to school quickly. And there is this constant hurdle race that happens with him at every aspect in terms of when a GBH hits. Uh, what was your experience when you met with this patient about understanding from diagnosis of neuroblastoma? to knowing that they could lose an eye to the fact that they could lose the person himself. What is that spectrum or the range that you saw? Um, so first of all, I want to say that having information is a very double-edged sword. And the reason I say this is because, uh, particularly when I was working with uh, retinoblastoma patients and their parents, um, See, the doctor can tell the patient, or uh, the parent actually, not even the patient here, that the child is going to lose their eye. And the parent immediately hesitates because the eye is such an important organ, right? We, um, we are so, so focused on functionality and uh, we're so focused on making sure that we don't lose any vital organs that the, the eye has to be removed is a very sensitive uh, sentence to say. However, we also need to realize that this physician sometimes has to say this and has to um, encourage decision making regarding this because some cancers really are that aggressive. And uh, sometimes what the physician also has to sort of juggle or balance is that they want the parent to have the information, they want the patient to have the information, they also don't want the parent to uh, delay treatment and cause more complications. Um, they also don't want the, the parent to take a decision where, and this, this has happened. Unfortunately, this does happen a lot of times uh, mm -hmm. where the parents delay treatment. It doesn't uh, happen until it's much more severe. And then that remains the only option. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in any other cancers as well, when we were looking at other types of cancers, we do realize that what parents really want is empathy reassurance and information that helps them navigate the immediate near future. Okay. So, um, is there a difference between adult and pediatric? Let me also clarify that. Yes. Yes. Because Definitely. the you know an adult would like to know a lot more than because he has to run the house, he has to come back yep. to work, he has to start earning a salary. So, Absolutely. have you seen this you know differences between the two? Yes. So I remember um, someone um, who who I knew personally, where this, this individual was a 50 plus year old woman um, mm -hmm. who felt a lump in her breast and she would not go to scan it. She would not go for scanning. She would not go for screening simply because she was so worried that if it comes out to be cancer, who's going to look after my household? Who's going to look after my children? What happens to my college going daughter? What happens to my husband who is still working? So giving this kind of a person an entire idea of what their illness might look like, what are the possibilities, I think it's very important for decision making as well. 
Mm. So for a lot of people, the C word or the cancer word, and I, I don't think this is just about the complications or the possible, uh, you know, difficult news that is involved. Um, when we were looking at uh, thyroid cancer research, mm. uh, people didn't realize that thyroid cancers are one of the most curable types of cancers. Yeah. They heard cancers and they panicked. So a lot of times if it's an adult, I believe that receiving the full spectrum of information can be very, very important. Um, for pediatric cancers, again, because our patients can range from anywhere from between very, very, very young to adolescents, um, that has to def differ. And I'm all, all I'm going to say is we need more uh, mental health experts. We need more uh, experts who are uh, trained in adolescent behaviors who are trained in um, the psychology of children to address these aspects. Because giving children and adolescents um, age-appropriate information, all of this is really important. So sorry, but circling back to the, the uh, anecdote that I mentioned with, with the retinoblastoma breaking news, right? That um, you need to do the surgery versus you know the eye removal. Um, I believe that it's less about just the amount of information, but also how it is conveyed. Right. So like you said, we need an intermediate, we need tools, we need um, aids that can help these people take decisions because when the doctor told me, so this is again where the layering is important, right? The doctor tells us, I have 36 patients that I need to look at. Mm -hmm. So I, the only way I can break the news is that this is what needs to be done and we really need to do it right now because it's crucial to be done. And the doctor is really telling that from, you know, from their heart, they, they want to save this child. Every doctor who is working in that ward wants to make sure that this child does not come back with a relapse or, you know, they want to make sure that this child survives. And the parent is like, this doctor just told me a life changing thing in 30 seconds. My entire world has been turned upside down and it only took them 30 seconds. So from both perspectives, this is such a difficult conversation to have. So we need AIDS, we need intermediaries, we need... Uh, just like we have now, we have diabetes educators, we have cardiovascular health educators, we need cancer educators with specialized, specialized training um, and uh, they need to step in and they need to mediate this as well. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, yeah. We still have time for a couple more questions if anybody from the audience uh, you know, wants to go ahead and ask questions. We still have time for two more. Yeah, even your smallest of the questions can be helpful to somebody, you know, in, in a life uh, saving journey. So please don't hesitate to ask whatever you have in mind. Okay. It, it it just looks like there are no more questions. I'm going to refer my notes to see if there is anything that <laughs> left behind. Yes. Um, you clear the Viva with A++. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just on a lighter note. But I think this was really uh, you know important for us, Shraddha, to have this conversation. And I think this is not going to be a one-off conversation. We need to have a lot more on specific subjects. Like I, I think the five points that you mentioned, survivorship and QL, the patient, the parent, caregiver communication, the physician communication, psychosocial concerns, interventions that we can really quickly bring about. We don't need to spend a lot of time researching, knowing very well that even these smaller interventions can make a world of difference for some people. Let's bring that in. Let's see how to implement that. And I think let's talk kind of more often on this. And of course, the caregiver needs because uh, yes. in, in a pediatric scenario, obviously, the caregiver is, 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 is almost like the primary patient in one sense, where we know that, you know, they receive everything in terms of the world and the child merely between zero to four goes through what he has to go through from physically, he's not able to process so much. So, yeah, so I think these are going to be important conversations as we go ahead. But uh, yeah, but, you know, this has been amazing. And thank you so much, Shraddha, for holding space for all of us.